Greetings from the Humanities Research Institute at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and welcome to this presentation by Professor Jenny Davis, brought to you by Humanities Without Walls, a 16 campus consortium funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. My name is Antoinette Burton and I'm the director of HRI as well as the PI of HWW. That's a lot of acronyms I know. Uh, Peggy, who's managing our tech today, is kindly posting some links that tell you more about HRI and HWW in the chat. Because we're broadcasting from Urbana Champaign, I want respectfully to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands are the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and they continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land-grant institution, we have a particular obligation to recognize the peoples of these lands and the histories of dispossession upon which our university rests. If you're interested in reading more about the University of Illinois' acknowledgement work or in learning about how Illinois engages with indigenous scholars and communities, Peggy's posting a relevant link in the chat. And keep an eye peeled for the fourth annual Humanities Research Institute work-in on December 1st, when Jenny will be running a workshop on what to do after you read the land acknowledgement. It's my pleasure today to introduce Jenny Davis, who's graciously agreed to partner with us in this stage of the Humanities Without Walls grant, which is built around what we're calling methodologies of reciprocity and redistribution. In her work as an anthropologist and her advocacy for indigenous scholars, Jenny thinks about these questions as a matter of practice and I know I speak for the HWW team in Illinois when I say we've already learned so much from her. A citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, Jenny is director of the American Indian Studies Program, associate professor of anthropology and chancellor's fellow of indigenous research and ethics here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on contemporary indigenous language revitalization, indigenous gender and sexuality, and collaborative methods, ethics, and repatriation in indigenous research. Her research has been published in the Annual Review of Anthropology, American Anthropology, Gender and Language, among many others. She is the recipient of two book prizes, the 2019 Beatrice Medicine Award from the Association for the Study of American Indian Literatures for her book, Talking Indian, Identity and Language Revitalization in the Chickasaw Renaissance, published by the University of Arizona Press in 2018, and the 2014 Ruth Benedict Prize from the Association for Queer Anthropology and the American Anthropological Association for her co-edited volume, Queer Excursions, Retheorizing Binaries in Language, Gender, and Sexuality, out from Oxford University Press in 2014. Jenny's creative work has most recently been published in Transmotion, Anomaly, Santa Ana River Review, and many other places. She, in addition to being an amazing anthropologist and campus leader. She's also a poet of tremendous um, vitality and originality, really. And now I'll pass it along to you, Jenny. Thank you so much, um, Antoinette and the whole HWW team. I am excited to kind of kickstart our conversations around collaborative, reciprocal and redistributive models of research. Um, and uh, I wanted to let everybody know that we have another event that's coming up Friday, November 6th at noon, um, where we'll be hearing more information about how um, different scholars who have been doing this work um, and, and demonstrating these ethics and methods how they approach it, um, what works and what doesn't perhaps for the context and communities in which they're working, um, advice they might have. Um, so the goal I think is to generate a conversation and to recognize that these are um, you know, methods and ethics plural and there are a lot of approaches uh, and also that there are people that, um, that I benefit from being in conversation with and hopefully everyone else does as well. As a bit of background about myself, um, my training is in linguistics and anthropology, which are two fields that are um, uh, historically and or still extractive at best. Um, and uh, my research is in communities who are the most impacted by, not most, but definitely directly impacted by non-collaborative approaches to research and ethics. Um, so there's, uh, 
this area is kind of an unavoidable um, uh, mode of thought and, and practice for me um, for a number of different reasons. Um, and one of them is probably at the foremost that my research is also in communities of which I'm a member and of which I was a member before I started doing my research. Um, so with the, my tribe, the Chickasaw Nation back home and also within the um, Two-Spirit activism circles throughout the US. Um, so the ramification and impact of how I do my research is um, impacts me um, really explicitly in that it's going to impact my relationships with people and with people who are very dear to me. Um, and also um, because of the longer standing context, right, it impacts all of the people connected to me, particularly within my tribe. So if I behave badly, it impacts my mother and my nieces and nephews and the rest of my family. Um, so this is not a kind of casual interest, although it is one that I am very pa uh, passionate about. And today I'll be pulling from two texts that I think are gonna be available in the chat. Um, the first is an article by um, Miami scholar Wesley Leonard and Aaron Haynes um, on making collaborative collaborative, an examination of perspectives that frame linguistic field research. And the other is a chapter from Sean Wilson's book, Research is Ceremony, Indigenous Research Methods. And I think both are um, really wonderful discussions about various approaches to how to do research um, that I'll be talking about today. All right, um, so to just kind of dig in, the um, ways that we talk about our methods and our approaches to them have a lot of different names, um, way more than I have listed, right? But it may be referred to, depending on your field uh, and the areas that you study and are coming from, collaborative, engaged, activist, advocacy research, grounded, participatory, feminist, indigenous, decolonial, right? There are a lot of terms that could be applied. Um, and each of these terms have very specific histories and they're emerging out of conversations in our fields. And in fact, they might mean something quite different from one field to another. Um, so the goal here in these conversations is not to pick up or advocate for one particular um, paradigm within a particular project, but actually to think about what they all share, which is an explicit recognition that all research is, um, has a kind of ethics behind it. All research prioritizes some things over others, whether that's the outcome or the process or the timeline. Um, and so the more explicit we are about what those underlying priorities are and what our kind of ethical um, underpinnings are when we go in, the better off we're gonna be. Um, so uh, again, this may vary depending on, on what you're familiar with and what works in your field. And I imagine that um, what, how you engage with it will hopefully um, depend a lot on your own projects. Um, and it's also a conversation about methods and ethics and which comes first, a bit of a, a chicken and egg. Um, I know biologists, that's actually been determined, but um, uh, right, which comes first. And for me, the ethics come before the methods, right? So the prioritization of how you're gonna do research with um, communities, who you are as a researcher is what determines the methods and not the other way around. Uh, but I think we're often taught methods before ethics or sometimes methods instead of ethics. Um, and so uh, this is a, a goal to um, understand the relationship to each other and, and bridge those together. Um, and one of the things that comes up quite frequently in this conversation is um, if we're talking about methods and ethics, what about kind of replicability and recognizability if, for example, we're pulling from areas of study or methods that aren't known in our fields, right? We're submitting it to a journal, we're trying to get a grant for it. Um, so things like replicability and recognizability are things that we answer for um, in our day-to-day -day lives as academics. Um, and typically when I'm thinking about replicability, um, I have a lot of thoughts about repl replicability, but actually in, in terms of this, I would say, um, I tell my students that if two projects, two different projects use the exact same methodology, then one of them is doing it wrong. At least one of them is doing it wrong, right? So methods should not be copy and paste if they are be addressing um, local context, if they are addressing 
um, differences in um, project and goal and time and all of the good things that we have to take into account. Um, so what's replicable here is the ethics, right? It's, um, that's what we're gonna carry from one piece to another. And that's what we can take away from um, uh, what other scholars are doing and pieces of the methods, right? So some things may work from others, um, but not necessarily wholesale um, in approach. Okay, um, so what is a collaborative approach from my perspective of things? Again, there's different ways that this can be used. And I am aware that in an academic setting, a lot of times collaborative just means two people are working together, right? So you might have two academics who are having a conversation within the same field or across two fields, and this is called collaborative. Um, I think that says a lot about academia, but um, that's not quite how I'm framing it. Um, my uh, understanding of collaborative is that um, an, an ethical approach and a collaborative approach um, is one that um, prioritizes the redistribution of power, of resources, and benefits in research. Um, and that includes a, a redistribution of authority and expertise, a redistribution of decision making, of financial benefit. And I think it's important for us to think not just about kind of a, um, a short term or explicit means um, within a single grant, but also to include longer term socioeconomic benefits of research and also a redistribution of access, um, whether that be to educational spaces, to narratives, or to social, political, and institutional power. And, nope, let's see, it's not cooperating. Oh, okay. Um, so this is a piece that I pulled from the Leonard and Haynes piece. And actually they do a really nice job of outlining what some of the different um, approaches to research have been and what they're prioritizing, whether it's an advocacy approach or an um, ethical approach or um, any number of other things, right? Um, and one of the biggest takeaways I think from this project is the weight of um, who gets a say in the development of a project and, and why that's important. Um, so here it's a demonstration that researcher needs and expertise are weighed equally to those of the community. Um, and in terms of timeline, that means that everybody's making the decision that the conversation to design a project starts at the beginning um, and is kind of continuous all the way through. This is not uh, typically how I think many of us have been trained to start a project um, or to go about research. And so it does require a slightly different approach. Um, and as we go along, I'll try to kind of weave in some examples of where these things have come up in my own research. Um, and then the piece that I pulled from the Sean Wilson um, book, from the chapter from the book, um, are actually ways that this gets taken up, this collaborative approach gets taken up within um, the indigenous research models that he is proposing and that other people have taken up as well. And that is often referred to as the three R's of research and, and learning, respect, reciprocity, and, um, sorry, I just fix this real quick. And then responsibility, yeah, okay. Um, so these are questions that he poses as central and key steps to any research project that need to be asked at the beginning, in the middle, at the end. Um, and there's a lot of text here, which is why we're sharing the, the project itself. Um, but one of the things that's emphasized in a collaborative approach is thinking about research as first a type of relationship, right? It is an interaction between um, human beings, and I guess uh, for some folks more than human beings, right, for people who are doing um, animal studies and studies of landscape as well, uh, but thinking about how to do that in a way that um, at the very least does no harm, but also um, may be uh, grounded in mutual respect and reciprocity. Um, accountability is another area that I think is central in these texts and that can be really helpful. Um, so these are some kind of core questions that um, they have proposed to ask um, and they work quite nicely also across a team of researchers, um, whether those are coming from the academy or from in the community and uh, sometimes both of those positionalities. Um, so some of these, right, what am I cont contributing or giving back to in the relationship? 
um, is the sharing growth and learning that is taking place reciprocal. I think these are going to be some of the things that are trickiest to pinpoint and also areas that are absolutely fundamental to be developed with the community in conversation. Um, so I'm going to do this slide and then hope maybe we'll pause for questions in case there's anything that's any that have come up um, so far. Um, as with all research modes of operation and, and processes, but particularly those that are um, different or in contrast to dominant modes of doing things, there are some what we might perceive as challenges or opportunities to taking a collaborative approach. Um, and one of them is that the research questions and the methods and the other aspects of research design need to be co-established from the beginning and they need to be regularly revisited and adjusted. Um, so again, this is a different way of thinking about research projects where um, they are coming out of conversation. They are often um, shaped through the needs and desires of a larger group of people than we're used to having in conversation. Um, and this means that the outcomes and timelines are difficult to anticipate. Um, this is not something that uh, uh, often grantors like to see, right? The we don't know, we'll figure it out is not really an answer that you can probably put um, either in, in a review board process or a grant application. So figuring out how to estimate and come to some general uh, hopes and procedures while still leaving wiggle room for adjusting along the way is going to be one of the challenges um, dealing with the larger number of people you have, the kind of um, more work that has to be done interpersonally. Although I would say that the outcomes and timelines are difficult to anticipate for any research project. Um, you know, you, you have very little control over a lot of factors, including whether or not a pandemic happens in the middle of them. So um, this is not going to be something that is wildly different from other approaches, but it may be something that um, is presented as a challenge. So there are some requirements and I think things that um, you generally have to commit to from the get-go and know that you're um, going to be doing. So if the collaborative process is a redistribution of um, various things, this is often a redistribution away from researchers, right? Academic researchers and faculty. Um, these are things that we're not necessarily used to doing and have not been trained to do. So the sharing of control and the sharing of expertise is a thing that we have to commit to. And it's something that we probably have to kind of continually practice and maybe grow into being able to do um, because it may look a little different in each context. It may be something that we also have to fight for um, if for example, you're in a field where co-authorship is not something that is recognized or is seen as um, diminishing the amount of work that you did, right? Um, then you might be having particular challenges and things that you have to agree to do. Um, this requires a very honest uh, approach about, about who we are as researchers. Um, so if you're meeting with someone and deciding what kind of project you should do or how you'll approach um, a, a research question, they, you have to really be honest about what your skills are, what your limits are, why you're doing this work, um, what your level of commitment is. If this is a project that you're willing to do for the next six months or the next year or the next three years, that's gonna be important information to share. And I'm not sure it's always one that we are uh, upfront about in our conversations, but that's an important component because it lets us tailor then what the project is. Um, and I would also say in my experience, it doesn't necessarily um, hinder or hurt the process. So if you've only got six months, there may be a project, a six months project that a community is interested in doing, right? And a way to tailor something. So it's not necessarily going to hinder research, but it is something that is um, going to be an important process. Um, the other thing is you have to be very honest about the um, dynamics that we're sitting in and um, what some of those realities are. Um, I think there are a lot of narratives, um, and this again depends on which communities um, or individuals you might be working with, but there are a lot of narratives that I know circle, um, circulate throughout um, the academic world that may not hold up um, when you're having a conversation outside of the community and may need to be kind of face straight on. One of them is the kind of access and privilege and financial component. Um, I 
I could buy myself dinner with the number if I had a dollar for every time um, someone has said that their research doesn't get them money, that a book they wrote, they don't benefit from financially, right? I think that's a common narrative that we have. Um, but if we were to step back and take a different approach to thinking about our research and what it does, um, in a context like Urbana, the median household income is 27,000. That is less than half of what a starting assistant professor's um, salary is, even in the humanities. So when we say things like um, we don't benefit financially, well, we do actually, right? I benefit financially from the research that I do. It's what counts towards my job. It's what counts towards tenure and promotion. And so it would be disingenuous to um, not be honest about those approaches, perhaps with myself and others. Um, and these can often be a place to um, have a conversation about um, some of the other realities that may not be uh, transparent. Some of it is that there are myths about how much money professors make. Some people imagine it to be much greater than it is or less than it is, I'm not sure. Um, but also what grant funding can and can't do. Um, this, uh, you know, uh, if you see the overall amount of a, a grant, it may seem like there's a large amount of money going into somebody's bank account when really that's going towards all sorts of things that none of us ever see, right? Um, so I think these kinds of conversations are often in areas that we might be more comfortable avoiding, but are going to be really critical to making sure everybody understands um, what the possibilities and realities are and really inviting a conversation for other individuals as well, right? Um, every individual of the research team or um, members of the communities we're working with. And so this leads me to the requirement of good communication. Um, collaborative approaches are perhaps, uh, the biggest strain is the requirement of constant communication and good communication and reworking communication skills. Um, so we, uh, that's going to be something to work on to adjust um, and in fact recognizing that there are great differences across norms of communication um, so that these are places to check in to find out um, how people like to communicate what's helpful um, if you're working with communities who have different uh, cultural norms then this might be a real sticking point in a place also to learn and grow as you move forward. Um, and then I think on this. The last thing is the um, recognizing that in a very exciting way, our research and our universities and our teaching, we benefit from models of inclusion that are frequently excluding particular types of knowledge holders. Um, so this is not the case of charity work down or we are giving to various groups and communities. This is an opportunity like the kind of symbol that we went with this, this year, the rain cycle. Um, these are things that directly benefit us. So thinking about how we benefited um, and how those processes kind of in the short and long term are gonna be beneficial to different people in different ways is um, a, a great conversation, a really exciting part of the um, collaborative approach and can really be instrumental in also shaping how we're thinking about what collaboration looks like. Right, um, and so that leads to some things to avoid. Um, that are necessary to avoid. So imagining redistribution and reciprocity as some kind of charity is not a good approach. Um, I think that that has been some of the strongest pushback to methods and, and the names of methods that have been um, proposed or emerged in certain moments, right? So um, various ways that advocacy or, um, or even ethical research models um, uh, are perceived, right, as um, having a very top-down or, or been, um, beneficial to, to the other um, way of thinking about things. Um, so that's uh, not really approach that, um, that is in the spirit of collaboration, right? That's not redistributing um, both the benefits and the work of these processes. Um, and the next two are, are connected. I would say one of the biggest things that uh, is a rework potentially for us or that we have to avoid is the inclination to opt out of difficult conversations or even just explicitly asking 
um, how things should be approached, um, what the process should be, what people want to see or not see. Um, and this happens in a lot of ways, right? So I think at a really basic level, all of us would like to think of ourselves as good people who have good motives. And therefore, maybe we can imagine that we don't need to explicitly ask questions about something or that we might be able to intuit our way through a process because that's our goal and that's um, our, our way of um, that's our intent, right? Um, and so I think that is something that we need to think about. There's also a way of saying um, or imagining, you know, I'm from this community and therefore I don't have to do these things. And I can say from absolute personal experience that that is not the case. Um, so, uh, you know, in my context, I had to go through um, really rigorous processes, some of which were built into um, the research design or required of me. So the Chickasaw Nation has its own um, research review process that was um, very uh, educational to me. Um, and I also had to have a lot of conversations with people about what they did or didn't want to see, what, um, how they would approach things, right? Um, that I wouldn't have been able to anticipate even though it was a community I'd known my whole life, even though it was individuals that I had been working with in other research contexts for many years. Um, so it's not the case that we can just anticipate or an, into it and what, how we should be doing things, right? And that that approach of opting out or assuming that we can maybe guess um, or that we would just know is in fact a, a dangerous mode to be in and is not that kind of collaborative approach. Um, and that's true even if you've worked with a community before, right? So I think anytime that we might be tempted to say, you know, oh, well, I probably don't need to ask because I think I know, right? Or for various reasons, um, I don't need to ask. I think those are the moments we want to challenge ourselves. Um, and that's that's also connected to what I say um, in avoiding the golden rule. Now, this is not a suggestion that we shouldn't have empathy for people, which I think is usually how the golden rule operates. Um, you know, but the golden rule is do unto others as you would have done to you. Um, but this imposes your perspective and priorities and understanding of the world onto other people. And so it's kind of the exact opposite of what we want to be doing. We want to be doing onto others as they would have done to them, right? And you can't know what they would have done to them until you ask, until you have a conversation, and until you come to those decisions collaboratively and mutually. And so I think, again, there are lots of places where um, both because it's quicker and easier, but also um, I think anybody who would be thinking about this approach wants to do things in a good way and therefore might be tempted to um, just uh, take that approach without finding out, right? And we can't actually know for other people. And I would say, um, you know, I've been doing this work for more than 10 years. And this changes over time, even in the same individuals, right? So one of the things that has to happen is that you have to have these conversations regularly and you need to check in and say, this is what we've done in the past. Is that still working for you, right? How did that go? Would you change something about it? Um, and really make sure that the conversation and the collaboration is ongoing throughout the process. We did have a question okay. if you, um, from our colleague, Clara. Um, how do people without social science training learn to, to design questions for communities to start these conversations? Um, I think the conversations can have, aren't particular to the social sciences. I think that the social sciences, one of the things they do is assume that you would be potentially interacting with people along the way. So there might be a kind of approach um, that assumes at some point you would be interviewing someone, for example, right? Or sending a survey to someone. Um, but in general, those aren't necessarily, they aren't inherently collaborative processes. Um, and there are lots of approaches within the humanities that, um, or the, humanities outside of the social sciences that um, have some good uh, models that we could think about like oral history collection, right? Or, or some other areas. So um, I guess it's really identifying something you're interested in and are willing to do and would, um, would like to have a project and then thinking about who you might reach out to. Um, and to some degree, the less formulated your questions are, the better the project will go. 
um, because it actually allows for a lot of openness in. Um, so one approach is to actually say, this is a topic or a community that I would like to work with, reaching out and, and starting a conversation that says, are there any things um, either in general or within this area that you're interested in and you would like to have addressed. Um, and then that response helps you then kind of narrow down and think about what processes you could um, you could use, um, right? What methods you could use, but also what the question is in itself. Um, so if I say I'm interested in, um, you know, language and culture, and somebody says, I'm really interested in what's happening in this place over here. And you kind of back and forth, get to a place where you start that conversation. And again, I think that's where um, bringing to the table what you're interested in, what you would be really excited about, but also being open enough to have that be shaped, the end product be shaped by the responses you get and the conversations that come out of it um, are, are really the best part of the process. Um, the more specific and already determined your project is, the harder it is to find either to find a good match or the more likely it is that this will be a much less collaborative process because those things have been decided outside of a, a collaborative conversation. So the other thing I wanted to talk about that I think might be a difference in the way we approach research quite frequently is um, no is your friend in this process. And I think we're often, um, we might avoid no um, either as a form of rejection or because it seems like we have um, gotten something wrong because it seems like a stopping point. Um, but really no is a, a really important piece of the process. Um, it is a necessary piece um, and it is, let's see. Um, so, um, it is uh, something to seek out, right? Know is your friend. So for a number of different reasons. One, um, because of what we're talking about in terms of academics doing research with communities who may or may not be um, disenfranchised from re uh, the academy and research and have all sorts of histories that may or may not align with our own, um, there are hierarchies and um, structures of power in place. So in those contexts, no is a sign of trust. Um, you want to find places and invite conversations where people can say no. And no sets the boundaries, right? It gives you the safe zones. It lets you have a conversation about um, what should happen and what shouldn't happen, um, what areas to be sensitive about. We should have our own areas, right? Where we would say no. If someone proposes a project that you would be um, unwilling to do, that you don't bring the right skills or expertise, then our no is important um, and explaining why. So I think really opening up a space where no is something that we seek after, that we understand how no operates and how people say no is going to be really important. And this can include asking things like, um, you know, what's, what's the worst case scenario here? What do you not want to happen? What would be a real disaster um, going forward as we design this project? Uh, what are examples of things that have not gone well in the past, right? Have you, you know, has your, have you or your community participated in research? Um, and if so, what, what went wrong? And I think these are exactly the kinds of questions that let us um, think about what our boundaries are, what the things that we want to avoid really strongly um, in, in a very productive way. So again, it seems like it might be counterintuitive to the process, but um, really seeking out and um, opening up a space and really clearly inviting people to say no and, and asking them how they'd be comfortable um, articulating no if there are um, power differences um, is a really important and robust part of the process. Okay, um, and then the last thing that I was gonna work through are some moments of kind of where a collaborative approach has um, impacted a research project for me and, and some of the really exciting things that have come out of it. Um, one is the in the redistribution of expertise. There are a couple of things that come to play. Um, some of that may be co-authorship. Um, in a lab science model, 
there are individuals who are co-authors and I don't know, I mean, we've all frequently seen the, the paper that has 25 co-authors, right? And that's because the individual who contributes part of the data is recognized through authorship and people who contribute part of the analysis are recognized through co-authorship, right? Maybe the person who wrote the programming that allows for the analysis of large-scale data is recognized as a co-author. And um, I think that this is just one area of saying that if if community members are contributing to the design of a research project, to the establishment of methods, and quite frequently, if we're honest, to analysis and um, even some of the writing or giving feedback on the writing, then they are also co-authors of this project. And so, again, I think this is um, an issue where we want to be thinking also back about how do we reshape the environment that we're in to be friendly to these areas, um, to push back on the narrative that multiple co-authors means everybody did less work. Um, I don't know how that narrative ever came into existence because it must have been from somebody who wasn't doing collaborative work. Um, it's actually more work, right? The, the more people you have. Um, so uh, it may not have to be co-authorship. It may be something like naming the contributors in your book. And this is a piece that Sean Wilson discussed quite often um, in a field like linguistics or anthropology. And in fact, quite broadly, there's an assumption that pseudonyms are the norm and should be used because they protect people. Um, but quite frequently, they also erase the people who are the knowledge keepers who have contributed that information. Um, and it may erase their, um, the ways that their ideas circulate in the world. And so I think maybe even just not taking that as a given saying, would you want a, a pseudonym used for you if and when and how, and not presuming for the person that being anonymous would be the best approach, or even that some type of pseudonym protects them from being recognizable in a text. Um, so in, in small community contexts, you can, take away someone's name, but if you give two pieces of their demographic background, you have let everyone know from the community who they are. So um, these are the kinds of conversations at the beginning and kind of throughout where we don't just assume that um, the models we've been working from are where, how we're gonna move forward. Um, this is also, I think, part of the consent process where it's often seen as an individual thing, um, but um, and in fact, uh, the review board, the IRB would prefer that, um, but that may not be the most conducive to everybody feeling empowered and knowledgeable and co-creating the process. Um, so one of the things that has emerged in the um, Chickasaw Nation is that if you're working with a group of people for a project, then your um, information session is actually as a large group. Um, so we do a presentation to all of the who, who are interested in coming to all of the speakers and they sit around and as a group ask questions and get clarified information. Um, there's no rush. We bring food. Um, right. There's a, a kind of general conversation to the process of finding out um, the specifics of whatever is going on. And this is usually even in a long term project. Right. What we're going to be doing in this next stage. Um, so moving away potentially from an individual approach to a um, thinking about how and when it's beneficial to have multiple people involved, um, even in the methods of interviews. You can do interviews with multiple people rather than just one if people feel more comfortable um, and actually that generates an entirely new type of conversation um, in terms of the, the information you might be getting and the conversations you might have. Um, and let's see. Um, the other things are things that I think uh, have come out of things that I can contribute to projects that I wouldn't necessarily have assumed. Um, some of that has included helping communities with um, the development of research protocols and offering training about what people's rights are when they participate in research. Um, so within the two-spirit context, which is multi-tribal, um, frequently in urban contexts, um, when we were talking about what's the worst case scenario or what are the bad experiences you've had in research, they said, we have researchers come in, we don't know what our rights are, this went really badly. And so one of the things we did was set up a workshop about what their rights are. And then with two of the groups, um, we worked to create a 
um, their own review protocol for researchers if they wanted to work with the groups. And then uh, for one of the groups, I was the first person to go through it. So I helped them um, work, create the protocol and then they put me through the ringer going through it. Um, and so again, these are areas that are, um, I have the you know capacity to help think through what these would look like with a community um, that I wouldn't have expected um, necessarily ahead of time. Um, things like grant writing, um, or helping groups get access to financial resources beyond the specifics of a grant, right? This is again, a kind of long-term concept. Um, so this is helping to write or writing grants of which I am not a PI, of which the beneficiary is the group itself, um, but through which grant writing skills um, are something I bring to the table and are ways of kind of um, thinking about how to rework what access they have to things like grant funding. Um, and again, this is kind of a larger conversation where we think beyond just the scope of the particular research project at that moment. Um, and that also includes sessions around how to access things like higher ed. Um, these are sometimes really basic. How do you apply to college? What do you have to have, right? How do you decide what your major is? Um, and sometimes they are thinking about providing types of training that might be recognized in an application process. Um, and then I will think, yeah, my could last. I, could I ask a question for yeah. somebody? Um, so Daniel asks, I think apropos of some of the things you've just been saying, can you give us some advice on navigating the space between reflection and urgency? That is between, on the one hand, the time needed to build meaningful relationships for collaborative analysis, where we think alongside of collaborators, and on the other hand, the imperative of institutional urgency, timelines, funding, disciplinary pressures. Uh, yeah, so um, those are all very real things. And again, I think one of the key things is to be honest with yourself about it and then to communicate the how and why of that. Um, with people that you'll be doing research on, because I think there are often um, projects that are well suited to a short timeline. There are projects that um, might be good entry points. So if you, you know, the big project that deals with heavy and, and complex and potentially um, damaging or da um, dangerous topics, maybe that's not your first step. Maybe your first step is the kind of project that's um, quicker or easier to do that is something that is of, of more or more easily negotiated kinds of topics. Um, the other benefit of a collaborative approach is that it can also be collaborative in terms of um, you know, the researchers and the academics you're working with. So you might want to work with a community, but had not have the experience or established relationships with them, not have a similar background. Um, but that could be a great moment to have a collaborative project with another researcher who does have a relationship with those communities, who does overlap more closely with the um, background dynamics. And so that's a way for us to really also rethink um, I think an important question in, from the indigenous methods perspective is, are you the best person to be doing this job? Um, are you, should you be doing this alone or as a group? Um, and so if it's the case that you're doing something um, with really no background, um, then figuring out how to do that in a way that is, again, going to facilitate the best types of interactions and um, and relationships with people may involve me bring in other people, right? Who bring that expertise. That's a, I mean, or, and, or maybe it's another way of saying no. I mean, if, if the, there's, if the timeline is so urgent that it actually can't be accomplished, then maybe you actually step back and say, we're not going to do that. Um, or we're not going to do it now. We're mm -hmm. going to slow it, slow it down. Yeah, I mean, I think if you can't do it in a, in a good way, then I think it's a moment to say, then I'm not gonna do it or I'm not gonna do this particular thing in this way. Um, so the urgency and the narrowness of the way things get recognized or funded um, is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So because people have been asked or modeled to do think, research in a particular way, that's been the excuse for really damaging research practices for like 300 years or longer, right? So um, that is often the excuse. I came in, I needed to get this, 
for my dissertation project or my first book. And I didn't have a lot of time, but I was going to do it better the next step. But then, you know, other things happened. And um, so I think um, that's where the, the really sitting down and saying, what is the commitment? What am I able to do? What do I bring to the table? Um, if the answer is that you bring nothing to the table, then pick a different project, right? Um, if it's that you don't have the time to do it in a good way, then I think pick a different project or work with people for whom this might be a longer term project, right? So if you are only able to commit um, or coming in with a year's worth of time or two years worth of time, but somebody else wants to do it for the rest of their you know, foreseeable career, um, then, then pair up in ways that might benefit everybody involved. Interesting to think about time as a form of extraction. Um, not, you know, not just knowledge, but also time. Anyway, um, you want to go back to your, are you, were you done with that slide? I can't tell. Oh, I just, um, the other thing that I would say that's come into play in terms of thinking about expertise and moments where I have um, been able to rethink them um, is in the process of, of the review and feedback process. Um, so we, as academics value, perhaps begrudgingly, the process of getting feedback and evaluation from reviewers in our fields, right? This is a required component of it. Um, we recognize that experts in our field have important feedback to give us and are a step in making our research better and more robust and making sure that we cite reviewer two. Um, so one of the things that I've been able to do that's been extremely helpful to me in a number of ways is to actually build in a process of also having community expert reviewers, right? So if I assume that an anthropologist or a linguist is going to read my work and identify some things I've missed or things that I should add, um, this is also gonna be true of the community itself. And so um, I have individuals who I, who read my work and give me feedback. Um, and it looks a little different depending on which community it's in. Um, in the context of the Chickasaw Nation, the person, or there's the two people who are doing that work, it's part of their job at the Chickasaw Nation. And so I don't pay them because that would actually be violating Chickasaw Nation's rules for things. Um, but in the terms of say the Two-Spirit community or other contexts, I do pay them, right? As, as, I, as um, the reviewers for a book manuscript are paid in our context, right? And so I think it both thinks about the financial redistribution. I'm not asking them to do it for free. I don't think this is something that they would, um, that they should do without pay, even though um, my academic colleagues would. And it's also recognizing their expertise. This is definitely a moment where the kind of reciprocity and redistribution comes all the way back for me. This helps me well, it helps me a lot of ways, right? It's, it's being checked and um, I'm getting feedback, really valuable feedback from a different set of expertise than I would have otherwise. Um, it also helps me make sure that the, the process, the writing stage is not a moment where I kind of um, unknowingly or unintentionally disrupt that collaborative intent. Um, so it's, it's building it into kind of the writing stage as well as the other areas of research. Um, so, Let's see, I think that is most of them. Oh, and I will say that similarly, um, one of the processes that has come out of it um, is that at every stage when I am developing a research project, I make sure that it applies to me as well. And I ask what part of it, what, how do I go through this process? So um, in general, I don't use research methods with or, or um, on individuals that I haven't participated in myself. I think that's one way of understanding what the process is, but even in the consent form process, um, my, my consent form is uh, mutually, mutually signed. So in it, we've laid out what the project is and how people are participating and what they understand it to be and if they have particular requests and what the expectations are of them. That's very typical of a consent form. Um, but it also includes a sheet of paper where I have said what my roles and responsibilities are. It gives the contact information for my, um, so they can check up on me and I'm signing it as well, right? So I'm a mutual participant in this research project. And I think each of those moments where we kind of stop and say, um, you know, not just what are they agreeing to, but what am I agreeing to? And, um, you know, what have 
what have I agreed? What have I promised to do? And how am I participating in this um, as a way to move forward? So, um, yeah. And so, I mean, if there are other specific kinds of um, examples or moments, I'm happy to talk about them, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, Clara has a, another question. Have you worked with children? How would you imagine that kind of collaboration? Um, <laughs> well, um, I have not worked with children outside of their adult parents and family contexts. Um, So I know in terms of like a research board process, you would, you would involve the parents and family. Um, but that's also true, I think, of just good ethics, right? You need to be working with. Now, there are um, areas that where you're thinking about um, teenagers and emancipated individuals, right? So there are plenty of complex um, contexts. But um, one of the things that I think is important in thinking about something like a question about children brings to mind is that these are, even if we work with individuals or one particular subset of a community, the impact is actually to the whole community frequently. Um, and so identifying what the rules and norms are for engaging the community are, is gonna be a critical import, uh, piece. So um, regardless of what the university may require, right? Um, it may be that um, we aren't just getting permission from one individual to participate in something. It may be that we need to find out what are the norms, whether it's who the leaders are or what the organization is, um, or sometimes it's a literal organization, who do we need to work with and through in order to do this project? And I think for children, that's going to be particularly true um, because they are uh, like everyone else, but they're very much part of larger systems, right? And so um, engaging with them means engaging with parents or caregivers. It means engaging with um, the systems that they exist in. So a lot of people who are doing research with um, children are doing research in schools or um, educational facilities or camps, right? And then you have another layer where you need to make sure that you have, um, that you're doing research in a good way with um, those organizations, with those structures and the parents. Um, so taking a kind of larger approach, kind of step back approach to um, how would you do this in a good way and, and how do you avoid, um, uh, you know, not doing it in a good way, particularly for populations um, like children, right, where that would be, I think, especially, especially easy to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, that's where Again, I think thinking about it from a community perspective and asking, you know, coming in and asking how to do it in a good way um, protects us as, and makes our research better um, because just assuming we know what the process or what the best way to do it, um, it gets really, gets really dangerous um, with communities that, I mean, I guess in the review board context would classify as um, vulnerable, right? So I had a question. Um, I know that you saw this and maybe some other folks in the audience also watched our event with C the Sea Hearts Research Cluster um, a couple of weeks ago where they spent a lot of time talking about the processes and methodologies that they themselves had brought to collaborate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the, the processes of collaboration for the research team itself. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? that maybe all the things that you've said uh, heretofore simply apply inside a collaborative research team. But I wonder if you have other, or whether you, what, what you'd have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I do think most of the, most of the kind of general practices work whether you're, you're co-creating and collaboratively working with individuals who are your colleagues at the university or colleagues at across a number of universities. I think, um, you know, the communication aspect is key, but um, I think there's often, this is a place where we shouldn't assume that we know what good communication looks like and that it works equally for everyone. Um, so basic questions like, how often do you wanna communicate and in what format can be a really basic question that we don't necessarily ask. Um, do you wanna be copied on every email or do you want me to give you a summary at the end of the week? Um, and one of the really, 
fundamental things that's come out of um, Wesley Leonard's work, which is it's a different piece than the one I posted, was actually that um, he was looking at why so many research projects between academics and um, Native folks, um, Indigenous people, primarily in the US and Canada, go so badly, right? So if people go into it wanting it to go well, why does it go so badly? And one of the things he found out was that at a really fundamental level, what was happening was that the these different groups of people had different definitions of the word language. And so they're having a conversation frequently and they're basing their entire research projects around language, but they didn't actually come to a mutually agreed upon understanding of what that term was. And so everybody is saying, yes, we wanna do a project on language. Yes, we want to collect language, this is important to us. Um, we wanna do X or Y, but in fact, they meant different things by language and what the boundaries of it were, what it entailed. Um, and so that kind of, um, if it's not a group that already has some kind of process developed or has a shared terms, um, then kind of starting really, really basically um, with what are the terms and what do we mean by them and what are the ways that we communicate or don't want to communicate? Um, how do we, I mean, I think this, the Seahearts presentation was incredible on so many levels, but they talked about the ways of kind of recognizing and intentionally addressing and minimizing the impact of hierarchical difference, right? And power difference. And so the resistance to having a designated leader. It may be that your project needs a designated leader and that's what's gonna work well, right? But it isn't necessarily required. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that, you know, either either emerge naturally if people if people do these kinds of processes well or um, are well suited towards it, or they can, you know, explicitly be drawn out and agreed on. Great. Um, Peggy's about to put um, a reference in the chat to the Bendix et al. book um, by the University of Illinois Press, which they talk about this language issue, although not necessarily in a community collaboration context, so she'll put that in the chat. Um, we're coming up to the end of the hour. I'm aware that it's after five o'clock. Um, any last questions for um, Jenny? Do you want to talk a little bit about what's coming up on the 6th of November? I know you said it at the top, but in case people came in late. Yes, absolutely. Let me see if I can. Um, so, so as is hopefully um, apparent through this conversation, um, there are uh, as many different ways to do a good collaborative project as there are projects and communities. And so um, as part of the conversation and really celebrating um, that multiplicity, um, the, we have other experts in this area who are going to be presenting on campus. Um, so on November 6th at noon, we have uh, Cora Maldonado, who is my colleague in American Indian Studies and Anthropology, um, who is a, a phenomenal uh, collaborative researcher and um, and scholar, and um, she's gonna be talking about her work in the Maya Interpretive Collective and more broadly. Um, and we also have Ruby Mendenhall, who is affiliated in a number of places, including <laughs> sociology and African-American studies, um, and talking about a couple of different projects that are often kind of um, interrelated through their collaborative goals, right, and processes. So Seahearts and Designing Spaces of Hope um, and the Community University Think and Do Tank. Um, so we'll get to hear about right? Um, what their thoughts and experiences are, um, recommendations from different communities, different contexts, um, different research areas and questions. That's great. Thank you. Peggy's just put the uh, link to that in the chat. So if you're interested, you can register or you can find it on the HRI web page where if you go to the calendar, you can also see that Jenny is giving an out of isolation talk uh, uh, on um, COVID and in Indian country uh, later in, in the, or rather in the month of November. Uh, and you could see all the other great stuff that we're going to be doing this semester. And um, we'll have more um, reciprocity and redistribution events in the spring as well. Um, we're happy to see everybody and um, look forward to seeing you on the 6th of November or in some other Zoom room. So thank you so much, um, Jenny. That was really great. Thanks.